Jeremy, I am so excited to get to talk with you about Miraculous Ladybug and Cat Noir Awakening. I was enchanted by this film. No way! I was utterly enchanted. And one of the things that really stands out for me with this film is that you made an animated musical. This is a musical... An, an adventure musical in the truest sense of the word because every one of your songs is essentially part of the dialogue and the story. Oh, thank you so, so much, David. You made me think, you made me think immediately of those fabulous old MGM musicals where the oh. songs were part of the dialogue and that's what you've done here. So everything is so cohesive with this story, nothing is just dropped in there for effect. At every turn, from the animation, from the use of color, the specificity of the color, the blend of Asian influences and the mythology of these uh, miraculouses and Kwamis, with the hallmarks of what Paris is known for, you really blend this so perfectly and you give us characters that you can't help but like. Okay, maybe not Hawk Moth. Maybe not Hawk Moth. We're not too happy with him. <laughs> not but what I find really fascinating is that you had this, the series has been going for a number of years. Now here we are. You don't just pick this up where it would be in the series. This is really an origin story at a feature level, and I think that's fabulous, but what made you decide to do it that way? First of all, thank you so much, Debbie, because uh, as a director, it, 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 this goes straight to my heart, as you can imagine, and uh, it was very complicated for me because I'm a producer of the show, and you know, when you are so, at, so attached to your own show, and I grew up with it the last 10 years, it was very complicated for me to really try to tell a story in one hour and a half that I felt for so many years before. So I really had to think as a director and think not about myself, but think about the audience. Because my dream for that brand was the parents and the young kids to be able to watch it together in a kind of four quadrant movie. So I really tried to take what's the essence of the brand and make it a movie and not try to make a show into a film. You know what I mean? I didn't try mm -hmm. to stretch five seasons into one hour and 45 minutes. So to me, I really wanted to tell a story which the core, what was the core of this story, which is there is a catch-22 love story there is a very deep message for the character, which is that it's about self-esteem, believing in yourself, and to understand that the true hero is the one behind the mask. That was, for me, the best and the most important message to share with that film. And making it, making it as a musical was a big bet, but it was the only way for me my emotion could express. It was through music, and um, it was a bet because... The, the first superhero musical animated movie so far. So that's why I wanted to make an origin movie because there is a love story and there is a princess and prince story, but this time it's a girl power and she can kick butt, if I may say, you know? Yes, she does. And she's no sidekick. She's an equal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like she says, actually. I think the decision you made is great, and this is perfect for people that don't know the TV series. It was the goal because I couldn't make happy both of them, you know what I mean? It was for me about sharing the IP, because the IP is very famous to the fans. They 
love it all over the world. It's everywhere. Everybody is crazy about what they like it. But it was more about how can I make a family film where the message can be deeper than what you can have into a lot of episodes. This time it was really about I want to share my brain with my parents as a kid and I bring them with me to watch that film and I want everyone who doesn't know the brain to discover what the core DNA of it. But at the same time, it's a different verse, which means that if you discover the film first, you can still watch the show and you won't have a feeling of a repetition because it's really a different story. Well, I know one of the things, you don't have as many characters. Of course, with the TV series, you've had multiple seasons to bring in all kinds of Kwamis. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, we've got best friends who have Kwamis and have ha superpowers and all. But you just give us the basic intro here, and you've set this up perfectly for a feature sequel as well, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you. But, you know, there is also one thing, because... When you look at it like that, you cannot really imagine that when you write in the story room, you realize that this movie is about 10 characters. 10 characters. You have Marinette, Ladybug, Adrienne, Cat Noir, Tiki, Plag, Gabriel, Okmoff, Master Fu. You know what I mean? And you have, of course, all the other one that. It's really about many characters, and it's not a lot of time, actually. So yeah. we really had to, to say the right, right thing from the right people, just to be sure that uh, you don't feel lost, and you get a little bit of everybody, and just enough, but not too much. It's a balance. It's a balance that we have to, to work a lot on. And uh, it is what it is today, so I'm so glad that you like it. Well, I think you found a good balance, because even with our supporting characters, with Alia, Nino, we get enough of them. We understand the best friend connections with Alia and Marinette and Adrian and Nino. So we get that. They don't get shortchanged. And I like that. They weren't throwaways. Same thing with Wong Fu. He's not a throwaway character. Every character has a purpose, and you make sure that they get screen time so we know their purpose in the grand scheme. And I and appreciate I you did that. And I tried to insert and pay them off. All, you know what I mean? Wong Fu is looking for the most, and at the end of the movie, Lady Bird giving back to him. Everybody has an art. And I tried to close the arcs as much as I can. But, you know, I grew up the last, I, I say I grew up, but I spent the last 12 years in America. And I really learned a lot from there. I learned from storytelling coming from America. And I really tried to make it uh, the way uh, we make it in America, with the values at the center of the story. Mm -hmm. But core message. And then... You put all the colors and all the action and all the visuals, but it's, it's not everywhere that you can understand this. But I, I always said that when I talked to my team, I said, guys, this is, this, this is an American movie. I'm French, but I really made it like an American director because I grew up so much with all the Disney movies and uh, till now, actually. And, and that's it. And I, I really try to, to make it this way, and I hope the world... We like it as much as we enjoy making it. Well, I think they will. You know, I want to talk to you about the actual production, the animation design, and particularly with your, you've got full-scale musical production numbers here with your, <laughs> with the songs. One of them in particular, it reminded me so much of Boz Lerman's Moulin Rouge when they're dancing on the rooftops amongst the clouds yeah, and the stars. Uh, that right away, and that I just yeah, loved. Yeah. Pardon? It, it's one of my reference, Moulin Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw that immediately, and I just got a big smile on my face. Uh, that... No, because I'm listening. I'm I'm not on video, so I'm just I'm just listening. <laughs> right. Oh, 
I was I was playing a song just for you, David. Ah, uh, ah. <laughs> uh, but the and production numbers are difficult enough for live action. How challenging was it from an animation standpoint for these musical production numbers? I was lucky enough to work with incredible people who surrounded me into the music process, including, of course, uh, Harvey Mason Jr. and Michael Gracie, which oh. is the director of The Greatest Showman. So it really was about me expressing my emotions through music and them helping me to translate it to the big screen. So it was a very incredible process. We've, we've talked about it this morning, actually, with Michael. We remind to each other. We, we've tried a little bit to remind how it was during the first day we met. And uh, I think having them on my side really made a huge difference. And that's why it works for both parents and kids. I didn't want to make too, ma too much uh, kids' songs, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the message into it, the world, the Larry, talks a lot to the parents as well. Oh, absolutely. And something that I really appreciate that you did is for the musical numbers. These are, you've got an orchestra. There is an, a full orchestra doing the music, doing the individual numbers, doing the score. And I can hear the different instrumentations that come out with some of the character motifs that are created throughout this. And a lot of people don't pay that much attention to an animated film in that regard. And I'm so happy that you did as the director. It was very important for me because I edited the movie with my hair first. That's how I started to tell the story. I wrote the music, I composed the score. And the score, you know, we've, made, we've done all the score at Air Studio in London with the Orchestra Philharmonic from London. We had, uh, we have, we had 85 people, 80, 85 musicians in the choir to, to play the music. But to me, it was very important that emotion starts with story and music, music and story, it's one piece, you know? And then the rest is driven by that. At, actually, at least it's my process, but music was a... We couldn't make that level of animation and that level of rendering without having the max of the music that we could give to, for that film. And we were very lucky to have a, an incredible, incredible journey on the music side. I think the music, the score alone, is beautiful, but then you layer in the eight song, your eight, seven or eight songs that you have, and it just elevates the entire movie-going experience to see this film. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David. Color is so important in this film for identifying our characters. Did you? Because it's been a while since I've seen any of the TV series episodes. Because over the years, I actually have watched some of them. I'm curious about your color choices with the action and things that are happening, such as Hawk Moth and the purples and the greens underground, and then our use of reds, blacks, green energies, even when Ladybug and Cat Noir, when their fingers touch and we see the green energy. What kind of thought went into the color choices that you've made in this film? I really wanted, you know, I thought about it like a kid. To be honest, I really think about it like a kid with all my memories from all the classic Disney movies that I love and all the anime from Japan. So when you, when you talk about the first song and Marinette speaking about the uh, if she could believe in herself, you know, it's, it's very much the colors of Belle in The Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. When you do City Song, it's a magical place, so I use a lot of sparklings. And to make a sparkling effect, you need to have a very dark room. So that's why the, the room with City is more dark, it's more mysterious. You go more into a Spielberg-type movie, Emblem movie. And into it, you put all the, the, the sparklings that you can get in Disneyland. Then, when you at the parade, you know, then when you go to Ladybug, we use the red light because this is the power of the coccinelle of the Ladybug. And um, to play with that color, it's a lot of energy. The red is an energy color. 
the red, the, the green of Okmoth, of course, is a spooky color that I wanted to use. It's not scary, but I wanted it to be spooky. Mm-hmm. So very important in the breed. Spooky, spooky, spooky. Not scary. Spooky Halloween, you know? Which means that it's funny at the same time. And that, by the way, you see the way I play with the character, the way he acts, the way he dances, the way he speaks. He's a little bit caricatural. Yes. It's not this way. For the kids to say, like, I don't like this guy. <laughs> but they, I didn't want to be scared about this guy. I wanted them not to like him. And his plan was very obvious. And, um, and of course, for the romantic song, playing on the roof of Paris and uh, playing piano. I've never seen a superhero playing, playing piano in a, in a, in a, at the opera, you know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. in, a, in, a theater, in a theater. So that's how I drove the music. I, I mean, I wrote music and visuals at the same time. So it was part of the whole brief. Now, do, when you're writing and creating this, do you storyboard as you go along? Alors, what I do, first, I compose the music. Because with music, I can explain the thing, and then I say, okay, guys, now close your eyes. And, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we got it. And then they start storyboarding. But the storyboard is most of the time always right. Because the, when you give the music, you give the rhythm. And when you give the rhythm, you give the emotion and the tone. So that's why I always give music because this cannot lie, never lie. <laughs> now, what kind of learning curve? Was there a learning curve for you going from TV series, individual episodes into one big feature? Um, I'm not sure I will do it again, to be honest with you, because I wasn't really free to give as much as I have in my heart. Because you know, the show of course has its own uh, rules. Mm-hmm. That's not perfect no matter what. But um, it, it, I know that it's a big challenge to adapt a show with a lot of fans because you will disappoint some people no matter what. And this is the last thing I want to do. I want to make people happy. I don't want to make people sad or disappointed anyway. So that's the thing I've learned. When you adapt a movie from a show, you have to make choices because a TV series is not a movie. And you don't say and tell the story the same way. So all you, you have no choice. You have to change a little bit the shape of your character. And this is what I've learned so far. Of course, among many other things that I've learned. But uh, about TV, movie, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I do want to ask you about going back to color and your palette for for a second here, Jeremy. I, I noticed what I love with your Paris exteriors uh, at the fair, which I love. I love the whole idea that you set this at a fair because kids are going to go crazy for it. Look, I went crazy for it. I thought it was colorful. It was beautiful. But the animation in that sequence, your entire background very, very similar, almost like a Monet painting with the softer colors that you're using I, I, for the... Whoa, whoa, you have a very good eye, huh? I d- what, I've done, what I've done on that, basically what I've done, I really, I really wanted to feel what we get when we visit Paris as a tourist, you know? You have that, the, the, the cap postal of Paris is this painting, and there is a lot of light. So it's very white. Mm-hmm. So I've played it a little bit like a Western movie sometimes, but it's, uh, there is this layer of white in front of the picture that makes you feel you are in between a, a painting, a dream, and a reality. And this is what I wanted to do, because otherwise, it's so electric between the color, the action, the candy, the the attraction, the, the characters and everything, that we needed to figure out something to make it very iconic. Mm-hmm. And to make it iconic, you cannot have very saturated backgrounds and very saturated characters. So we made that balance to make it pop and uh, look special. 
and you succeed. You really do. And even the buildings, like uh, the little boulangerie that Marinette's uh, family owns, the buildings, you've got tinges of like soft pinks or peaches or something, very old Europe, old world European popping up too. So we really feel a sense of place. And I just, it, those little details add, for me, add so much, Jeremy. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, baby. You know, I've tried to give what we have in memory about the timeless part of Paris. You know what I mean? What, we, what things are ti timeless in Paris? The pigeon, the cafe, uh, the, I mean, there is something that will never change, and I've tried to keep it not dated, you know what I mean? Not mm -hmm. to put it dated. But no matter what, whenever you will watch it, you will always feel movies on time. I mean, I felt like I was in Paris watching this movie. You've got the left bank, you've got the Seine, you've got everything there that we're used to identifying, right down to the mime. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Having the mime, I immediately thought Marcel Marceau. Like yes, that's what I said. I use all the classics with a little bit of twist. Everything you take, the, you are are masterful at taking these classic, iconic touchstones of Paris and giving them a little twist that modernizes it, that fits the the action idea of this story, and. You just succeed on every level, Jeremy. I can't tell you how impressed I am. Thank you so much. I would love to give you a tour of Paris. When you come, please be my guest. We'll have a, a dinner or lunch in Paris, and I will share with you incredible places that I'm sure you will love, because I can hear you are a Paris lover, Paris true lover, and uh, I really appreciate that, because I'm a lover of this city as well. Paris is on my bucket list. That's somewhere I definitely want to go. So now what's next for you, Jeremy? I know that your company, I know Zag, is always doing something. Toys, games, empowering projects um, for kids. What's next for you now that Ladybug and Cat Noir Awakening is coming out this week on Netflix? Yeah, it's very, very exciting. Um, what I'm doing now, it's, uh, I'm already halfway in production on my next movie, and it's called Melody, and it's a musical animated movie with starring Katy Perry. Ah! Yeah! My goodness! Yeah, it's, uh, it's, she announced it. It's, on, it's online, it's official, so it's a great movie, it's about... Uh, a little girl who really want to sing, become a singer, but she's homeless and she has nothing of a, a star and she has nothing of her idol, Rose Stella, which is the biggest pop star in the world. She lives in the Golden Castle. She's surrounded by millions of people who love her. And Melody has nothing of that, but she will learn through her journey that Rose Stella Actually, it's about the appearances, and she will learn that Rose Stella is a witch. And she Ooh. can perform any single rising star to make them disappear. Ooh. So, spooky. And um, the, 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 the theme of the movie is really about taking love versus giving love. You don't need to be loved to give love. And that's what you're going to learn. I can't wait for that. Now, you're writing all the music on this one, yes? Yeah, 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 of course. I wrote the music. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I, will, I would work on some songs with Kelly because Kelly uh, is a great, great, great songwriter. Yes. Of course, and we are working together on the music. But the score, I do in the show by myself. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait. But now I also want a sequel to Ladybug and Cat Noir Awakening. I want a sequel, Jeremy. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> oh, Jeremy, this has been such a joy to get to speak with you about this today. I love this film. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see Melody. 
and I can't wait to talk with you again. Oh, and I can't wait to have you as my guest in Paris. I'm going to hold you to that, Jeremy. Merci beaucoup. À bientôt, bisous.